If we want to make somebody upset or happy in the scanner, if we want to drive big signals in the brain, the most powerful way to do it is with movies. From the offices of the Wild Cornell Medicine Brain and Spine Center in New York City, this is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg. Internationally renowned scientist and researcher, Dr. Phil Stieg is neurosurgeon-in-chief of the New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center. This week, Dr. Stieg and his guest explore the neuroscience of movie night. Hello, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Zachs, professor of psychology and brain sciences at Washington University. Today, he is here to discuss his book, Flickr, your Brain on Movies. Filmmakers might not know the neurosciences around movies and brain function, but they have a tremendous understanding of perception, cognition, and emotion related to movies. Let's learn how movies can be more powerful than the written word in creating our memories. How does propaganda in films work, and how producers take advantage of our brains to achieve this? Finally, we will learn where our expert thinks movies are going. Jeff, thanks for being with us today. It's a real pleasure, Phil. Thanks for having me. When my producers brought this idea up, I was just ecstatic. You probably don't know this, but I'm a movie buff addict. I pride myself in picking up the little editorial cuts that get missed, you know, the, the pocket square that was in and then it was out on the next scene. <laughs> Continuity errors are a, a, a tremendous source of entertainment for those aficionados among us. Yeah. So I have to ask you before we start uh, talking about the meat of the of the matter: is were you a movie buff first or a neuroscientist first? So we're all movie buffs, right? Like this is the 21st century, and we, as a world culture, spend billions and billions on filmed entertainment. And I grew up in the thick of that, and. I think even more than most, I was a fan of the movies. I didn't really think much about movies technically until after I started as a cognitive neuroscientist. And in cognitive neuroscience, we're interested in how the mind works, how people think, perceive, remember, talk, decide, judge, control action, and how the brain enables those functions. And in my laboratory, we got interested in how people understand complex, everyday, dynamic activity. And so to give people experiences that were complex and naturalistic, but repeatable, we turned to movies. And we started filming like the world's worst, least entertaining movies and showing <laughs> them in the lab. And my idea was that we would make anti-movies, that we would film from a fixed head height perspective with no editing. So I wouldn't have to think about cinematography per se. But of course, I just described a particular viewpoint and a particular editing choice. So even if you're going to try that route, you're just thrust into it. And we quickly realized that there was just so many interesting things going on. And when we started looking at the dynamics of brain activity in relation to what filmmakers have access to, I just realized there was way too many interesting questions. I'm curious about the nuts and bolts of what you do. What techniques do you use to assess how I might respond to a movie? I would say the most important techniques are behavioral measures. We ask people to make judgments while they watch movies. For example, we can ask people about how tense or relaxed things feel moment by moment. We can ask people afterwards, what do they remember? We can show them pictures and ask them, was this picture a frame from the movie or a similar picture that you actually never saw? And we can measure their eye movements. So using infrared cameras, high-rate high infrared cameras and computers, we can track where you're looking while you're watching. All of that stuff can be super informative. And then when we go to measure brain activity with functional MRI, we're in a much stronger position to understand what is the significance of that brain activity. Let's face it, evolution, our brains have been developing for hundreds of millions of years. Movies have been around for, what, maybe a hundred or so. So our brains weren't developed for movies, as you've said multiple times in your book. But then you talk about some of the things that the brain does, this mirror rule. Tell us how that works. Sure. Sure. 
The mirror rule says that other things being equal, if you see somebody doing something, you might want to prep a response to do that same thing. So for example, if you see someone's face 20 feet tall on the screen, smiling or frowning or crying, you may notice your own face forming itself into that same pose. If you turn and look at the people sitting next to you, you may notice that as well. And if you see an actor flinching from an approaching object, even if the object itself isn't depicted on the screen, you may find yourself flinching. And if you look at little kids watching movies, you know they'll be fully up and out of their seats jumping around, performing the actions that they're seeing. And some of that is this fast automatic processing. I'm only going to ask you one kind of sciencey question here, because uh, otherwise I think it would be too deep. But you know, can you tell us what parts of the brain are tweaked, say, with mirroring, emotion, and memory? Sure. Let me start by saying, however you want to measure the strength of the signals being generated, there's no stimulus that I've encountered that drives bigger signals than commercial cinema. If we want to make somebody upset, or happy in the scanner, the quickest, most efficient way to do it is to show them a movie. If we want to drive big signals in the brain, the most powerful way to do it is with movies. So you find areas including the amygdala and the orbitofrontal cortex. These are parts of the brain that we know are important for adaptively processing emotion in the real world and for forming emotional memories. They're highly activated at appropriate moments when perceiving emotional cinema. The visual parts of the brain show massive signals rising and falling rapidly in response to changes in the visual information. And you see activity in the motor cortex that is time-locked to actions that people are observing, and that's related to this mirror rule that we talked about before. So that's just a few of the big effects that you see. Thinking about action movies, what are these directors doing to suck me into that action movie? Other than just, you know, cars blowing up and guns going off and loud noise and intense music. I got that. That's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Those are... but, yeah, but there's something they're doing with the camera, yeah. you know? It's, all right, I'm being sucked in. Let's enjoy the ride. <laughs> yeah. So sound effects and motion are intrinsically attentionally engaging. Anything that's a transient signal in your environment, your perceptual systems will tend to orient towards. So, like if there's something starts moving, your brain will orient toward that. If there's a new sound, your brain will orient towards that. So in an action movie, you've got that stuff happening at a really high rate, and that helps too. That's tightly integrated with the way those sequences are edited. The editing can do things like direct your attention spatially. If I have like a new object appearing or something exploding or something starting to move on one side of the screen, then I'll orient there. If you have more editing, I'll reorient more toward the middle of the screen more frequently. All of these things the director and the editor can use to control my attention over time and to re-engage my attention when it might be flagging. If you track people's eyes and you compare tightly edited sequences to more static sequences where you have a camera pointed at a scene and the action unfolding, That kind of filmmaking allows different people to explore the scene differently. Whereas if you cut frequently and you keep things in close up, everybody's gonna be looking in the same place at the same time. One of the striking things about editing is how invisible it is. A demonstration that I often do when I give talks is to show an action sequence and then ask the audience to estimate how many edits there were in the 30 second clip that I showed them. Typically, people underestimate by about a third, but it can be even higher in some situations. One powerful mechanism of that missing of edits, what uh, Smith and Henderson have called edit blindness, is if the edit is followed by a big transient signal. So for example, if you have an edit and then an explosion, or an edit 
and then a car driving in front of the scene. That dramatically reduces the probability that you'll notice that there was an edit. And even when we deliberately monitor and try to detect edits as they're happening, it's kind of surprising how many you can miss. Earlier, you referred a little bit to this concept of bottlenecking, you know, where you get so much information that and your, your brain can only process, what'd you say? Most people can remember at most seven things. So if you overload them, you can get them to focus on what you really want them to focus on? Well, I would say it's not even a matter of needing to overload them. It's just that the world is an overload. The world is more than our central processors can deal with by orders of magnitude. And part of what makes us so smart is our ability to just toss a vast majority of what's impinging on our sense organs and retain the good stuff or retain what we need. The stuff that we're holding on to isn't the fine details of the pixels or of the sound waves. It's not the fine details of the colors and the shapes. It's like, these are the objects and these are the people and here's what they're doing and here's why. I was fascinated also that you suggest and have proof to show that memories generated by reading a book are managed differently than memories managed by watching a movie. And in fact, you suggest that movies are more powerful in terms of our memory retention. Am I correct in that? Um, I wouldn't say that movies are more or less powerful than books. What I would say is that the stimulus itself affords very different things when you talk about reading a story versus watching a story. So on the front end, you're looking at a relatively visually homogenous set of characters on a page. You're looking at a static stimulus that changes only when you advance the page or turn it if it's paper. And in the case of a movie, you're looking at something that is changing rapidly over time and in also is multimodal, includes visual and auditory information. In the face of that, what's really striking is how much commonality you see across those two. So you find these time-locked motor responses and time-locked responses in auditory cortex and time-locked responses in areas of the brain that process spatial information that are very similar, independent of whether it came from a movie or from books. So if the brain responds in a similar fashion to both books and movies, but just more powerfully to the movie form, is that how those propaganda films work, similar to Frank Capra's Why We Fight series that you cite in your book? In the Capra movies, there were actually psychologists on the team, and they found that GIs who were quite skeptical of these training movies right after they saw them nonetheless accepted as fact information from those if you just waited a few weeks. They didn't distinguish well between information that they'd gotten from the movies and information they'd gotten from their buddies or from the newspaper. So propagandists have these powerful tools. They're well aware that if you repeat something often enough, I am quite likely to accept it more, in part because of the affective response associated with it, and in part because I may not be able to distinguish whether that was repeated from a credible or non-credible source. So what can we do as consumers? We can keep track of our sources as well as we can. And that often requires doing a little extra work, maybe taking some notes, maybe doing a little bit of extra research. These days, the doing a little bit of extra research part is just so much easier than it was for those GIs back in the 40s. Nearly a century ago, these words galvanized the movie-going public. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. Ain't By combining Al Jolson, America's number one singing sensation, with brand new technology from Western Electric called Vitaphone, Warner Brothers created their now famous blockbuster hit, The Jazz Singer. But not everyone welcomed the introduction of talking pictures. Gossip columnist Luella Parsons described the jazz singer as a passing fad, saying, I have no fear that the screeching sound film will ever disturb our theaters. While Irving Thalberg, head of production at MGM, dismissed the film as a good gimmick, but that's all it was. 
To be fair, many of the early sound films varied between technically inept and downright dreadful. Ladies and gentlemen, I am privileged to say a few words to you in this most modern and novel manner. The first living Vitaphone announcement ever made announcing... Noisy film cameras had to be locked away in soundproofed chambers, described as looking like giant iceboxes, forcing the actors to restrict their movements and stand as close as possible to the giant-sized microphones. Many performers and producers resisted the change as long as they could, in his 1931 masterpiece, City Lights, one of the last feature films released as a silent, Charlie Chaplin included a brief sound scene mocking the low fidelity of the Western electric system by dubbing the sound of a politician's speech using a kazoo. <laughs> Historian Robert Sklar, in his classic book, Movie Made America, documented an interesting change in how the audience responded to movies with the coming of the talking picture. In the silent film era, it was considered acceptable to talk during the movies. Audience members would share their reactions to the story on the screen and bond with their friends over the experience. With talkies, however, audiences had to be quiet to listen to the dialogue coming from the screen losing that sense of camaraderie and substantially changing the movie-going experience. As Sklar ironically observed, talking audiences for silent pictures became silent audiences for talking pictures. I can't imagine that high-end producers and movie directors haven't studied what you are generating from a data perspective, or is it they just understand what sells tickets through experience? They've looked at thousands of movies and learned empirically rather than scientifically. This is what I think of as the money ball issue, right? So people like me are not primarily focused on how to sell more tickets. There are lots of tickets being sold there. People are really good at that. And that's just not a focus of our research. The other piece of the puzzle is that people who really are experts and who have great intuitive experience in making and promoting movies often feel disconnected from quantitative research. And so to them, even if there might be value there, if there might be applied research that really would be directly relevant, for totally legitimate reasons, lots of folks in the business just don't see that as the most productive route to their ends. Somehow, I, I just can't imagine Scorsese not just going underneath that rock and trying to find out what's going to tweak but, me. And, and I can tell you, you know, one of the most fun, rewarding aspects of having drifted into this line of work is the calls and emails I get from time to time from filmmakers. You know, I've had the opportunity to interact with some folks whose work I respect just tremendously and am in awe of, and that's been super rewarding. So if there are any filmmakers out there uh, <laughs> listening to this, you feel free to get in touch. I always, I always love to talk to artists. And speaking of Scorsese, you gave a number of examples in the book about the violence in the movie Taxi Driver and the obvious effect that must have had on John Hinckley and his emotions. What's really going on there? So for those listeners who might not be familiar with this case, Hinckley was a mentally ill person who shot President Reagan and his press secretary. And in the time leading up to that, he repeatedly watched the film Taxi Driver, which features Robert De Niro as a violent vigilante character. And the first thing to say about that is that all of our actions are caused by multiple, multiple causes. And so it's not like watching one movie is going to turn someone into a mentally ill, homicidal person. Particular events that we experience in our lives, they influence us. And whether they're in film or in real life, experiences are going to serve as triggers, serve as cues, unmask ideas and we learn things socially you know people get ideas of behaviors that wouldn't have occurred to them to engage in but they might read about it or learn about it from the news or see it and that changes their behaviors all of these things do happen and it's also the case that exposure to violence chronically has modest but measurable influences on people's behavior <laughs> 
The consensus in the field at this point is that chronic and acute exposure to violent media can increase aggression in people. The chronic piece is very difficult to study causally, right? Because you can't just lock somebody in a room and make them watch a taxi driver over and over again for 20 years and then look to see how they behave. But you can look at it correlationally with very thoughtful statistical controls from lots of angles. And there seems to be a small but reliable association. And then you can do acute things. You can do experiments. And again, you can't get too extreme about this, right? It's not quite ethical to do experiments in which we deliberately provoke people to violence. But we can put people in situations where they have the opportunity to behave nicely or behave a little more aggressively. And we can see acute effects of watching violent media. So together, those things tell a pretty compelling story. You equated movie regulation with regulation of nutrition. Uh-huh in your book. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was curious about that analogy uh, and what your thoughts are. Uh, you know, obviously when movies first came out, there was an incredible governance in terms of what was decent and indecent. And now that obviously has changed considerably. What are your thoughts? I mean, for me, the analogy is, you know, like, no, don't take away my full metal jacket and my Quentin Tarantino. Those are important parts of my mental life. Just like I would say, you know, I live in St. Louis, so don't take away my Ted Drew's custard. <laughs> but if I were, you know, if I were eating custard every day, three meals, that would not lead to good outcomes for me. And I think when we think about our media diets, we want to think about a varied, healthy diet that's not all loaded up on empty sugar. As an educator and a scientist, do you think that there should be more media training in you know, grade school and high school to teach people how to selectively watch things and what to carry away from it? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, these initiatives to improve media literacy are super important to get people to understand where these stories and other media are coming from and to interpret them in light of where they're coming from. The organization Common Sense Media does a fantastic job helping guide families through media choices. They're not doctrinaire and they take age and development and situation into account really well in their guidance. And I think those kinds of resources are super valuable. Finally, Where's this all going? 3D versus stereoscopic, sound technology, vibrating seats. I, you know, I found it hard to believe that smell is going to affect my, my perception of a movie. Well, I know it would, but probably not in a positive way. And then I dread the day that I'm going to have to go and do a video game to interact with my movie. I like to sit back and be entertained. So what's all happening? You know, display technology for presenting immersive environments and allowing people to control their viewpoint more, that technology is becoming increasingly ubiquitous and increasingly high fidelity. Now, a simple version of that is just having a really big screen with a really wide field of view, right? So if you go to an Omnimax theater, you have much control over your viewpoint because the screen is much bigger than your field of view in that case. And so you really are looking around in order to control your viewpoint. If you're wearing a goggle display that tracks your head and updates your view based on where you're looking, that's an even more extreme version of that. So those technologies are gonna to continue to evolve. The coming together of narratively oriented gaming and what we think of as movies and TV is continuing to happen. One of the really interesting questions there for me is how will our culture and our psychology adapt to having shared experiences that are not quite shared because everybody makes slightly different choices? So I think there's lots of interesting questions there. Stereoscopic displays that present really vivid depth cues seem to keep like having a renaissance and then dying away again over and over and over again. I think that's really interesting. <laughs>
I end the book with some kind of more speculative stuff about, you know, there's lots of wonderful science fiction about jacking stories directly into our brains and what's the neuroscience that corresponds to that and is that ever something that could be recreationally relevant? And that, I think, remains to be seen. Certainly not in my lifetime. At least I think I'm happy about that as well. <laughs> I, you know, I don't want a, a probe on my head, nor, nor invasively put in to uh, help me appreciate a good movie. <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey Zachs, I don't know if I'll ever watch a movie in the same way. I hope that I can continue to enjoy movies and not think about how I'm being manipulated and how my mind is being played with. But thank you for enlightening us all on the techniques that directors, producers use to create the emotions that we experience at a movie. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. This Is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg is produced for the Wild Cornell Brain and Spine Center by the Really Interesting Picture Company. Episode producers are Geraldine Abinader and Hildy Rubin. The series is directed and edited by Tom Veltry with music by Lenny Williams. The announcer is Allison Power. Please sign up for our newsletter and get access to special episode-related bonus content at thisisyourbrain.com and follow us on Facebook at This Is Your Brain.